So, all right, let's, uh, let's get right back to our study, right? And as you can see, um, each week now, two weeks in a row, my handwriting has improved. I got, my, I, got, I got the wrong notes. I got notes from next lesson. Better grab this one. Look at that, man. I mean, my, you, you guys are seeing uh, miracle signs and wonders here. <laughs> okay. No, thanks, Lori, for putting that up there. So um, we're going we're gonna to go back to uh, uh, 2 Kings 23 here. 2 Kings 23. We do want to welcome everybody and also those listening by way of the internet. Uh, let's see, this is way behind here. Okay, that's better. Can, can you tell, Sherry, is sound okay? Can you tell? Yeah. Okay. Let us know. Yeah, okay, it looks like it is. Okay, great. Let's go back over to 2 Kings 20, uh, 23 here. And we're going to pick up at 2 Kings 23, uh, right around verse 30, just so we can get our bearings as far as where we are at and why we're here. It says, and his servants carried him in a chariot dead from Megiddo. What a way to start Bible study, right? Carrying a guy dead. <laughs> but it says, and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own sepulcher. The people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in his father's stead. Let's unite hearts in a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the wonderful time that we can spend this morning in your word, fellowshipping together. Uh, here in person with everybody's here, and then by extension with those that are not able to be here, but are with us uh, in spirit and on the internet. And we thank you for that. Father, we thank you for the, the oneness that we share in Christ, the hope that we share in Him, the guarantee that we have because of who you are, the God of, the God of life, God of truth, the God of integrity. And Father, we ask that as we study your word this morning that we, each and every one of us, might be strengthened and built up in the faith so that you would be glorified and Christ would be exalted, in whose name we ask this. Amen. Okay, um, you can see on the board here what we're going to again focus on this week. We began to look at this in some detail last time. This sequence of these kings that are reigning, that reign in the southern empire that eventually led to the uh, Babylonian captivity. So that's the goal today is look at some more details about this. And we have been in our study looking at the five cycles of chastening. We've already noted, look, let's do this very, very quickly. Go back to 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings 17. We're going to do this very quickly. We'll get, get, get a, a flow here, a sequence here. 2 Kings 17, 5. Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land and went up to where? And besiege it. So this is the beginning of the besiege of the northern empire by the, by the Assyrians. Everybody see that there? Verse 9, in the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hala and Habor by the river of Gozan in the cities of the Medes. And so look at verse 23. Notice, until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. So there is the information details about the Assyrian captivity of the northern empire. Everybody has that marked in their Bible right now, correct? So you know, you know when you're reading that, you understand what's happening there. So now when you fast forward to chapter 18, it's going to back up a little bit. Time-wise, verse 1, you've got Hezekiah's reign. See, it came to pass in the third year of Hosea. So that's a few years before the northern kingdom is carried into the Assyrian captivity. Um, you've got uh, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Remember that? What do you remember about Hezekiah's reign? Was it a good one or a bad one? Good. It was wonderful. He was one of the great reformers. And so when you look at chapter Chapter 18, chapter 19, the great reign of Hezekiah. But what happens late in Hezekiah's life? Remember, he has that sickness that's unto death. Remember over in chapter 20, 
He has a sickness unto death. He doesn't die. He, he beseeches the Lord. The Lord extends his life. Who remembers how many years? And, and what happens during that 15 year? T- two major events happen uh, during that that you see information about. Two major events, not only two, but two significant events recorded in Scripture happen in that 15 year extension of Hezekiah's life. Who remembers what was. Okay, one, Manasseh, his son. Is that what you said, Joseph? Yeah, he took him as born. Yeah, the, the, the one who, is next, who would be next in line to the throne, Manasseh was born. And then I'll bring up a question about that momentarily. What else happened? Remember he shows, when... He shows his kingdom to the yeah. people from Babylon. Everybody hear, hear what Tom said and Patty said? What happens is that he really kind of got lifted up a little bit with pride when the king of Babylon sent ambassadors to him. You know, theoretically, for, for good reason, okay. <laughs> um, he, showed, he showed them everything. It's everything. And, of course, what happens when you show people what you got? They want it. Assuming it's worth wanting, but, okay. and it was, okay. And the prophet basically says to Hezekiah, yeah, you showed them everything, and they're going to take it all. Remember that? Mm-hmm. So those, those what, what's that? Exactly. It's exactly right. Uh, uh, Joseph m- mentioned that it was Jeremiah is one of the prophets that uh, mentioned that to Hezekiah, that you showed him everything and he's going to take it all. Look with me at verse 14 of chapter 20. It, go, look at verse 13. It says, And Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver, the gold, the spices, and so on. I'm not leaving it out on purpose. I'm just going to run out of time. Then came, oh, it was Isaiah here. But Jeremiah also does convey this to him. Look at verse 14. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said to him, what, uh, what said these men? And so he says, well, they want to see everything. And he showed him everything. Look at verse 15. And he said, what have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah showed all the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is, there is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. And Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried unto Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. Isn't that something? It doesn't happen in Hezekiah's day, but it surely happens, okay? Let me sidetrack just for a moment. One of the ways that God... In Scripture, identifies how you can know whether or not He is the, the true and living and only God. You know how it is? You know what, what He does? Did that make sense what I asked? God, God tells us in Scripture how to know whether or not He's the only true and living God. What is... That's right. He tells the future. And He says it this way. If the future comes to pass exactly like I said, then I'm God. If, if even one minor detail doesn't come to pass exactly like I said, then I'm not God. It's that simple, okay? Here's an example. He tells Hezekiah that they're going to come and they're going to take everything, and they do. And from the time of the Assyrian captivity of the Northern Empire to the time of the Southern captivity uh, uh, by Babylon and so forth, there's about 130 years or so, depending on you know, because some of the kings reigned only for a few, few months, but it's about 130 years. So at this point, God through Isaiah makes it very clear to Hezekiah, they're going to come and take it all, all right? When you think about well, 130 years out, you know, you're thinking, well, that's, you know, that, that's way out there. We have plenty of time to change. Does Israel change? Not so much <laughs> at all, okay? So then what happens, chapter 21, you've got Manasseh, his reign, right? How was he? Oh man, he was the cause of the irreversible uh, judgment and wrath of God coming upon the Southern Empire. And yet, right at the end of his life, what do you remember that happened with Manasseh? One of the greatest conversions ever of any of the kings that had gone south. It's, It's amazing. And yet, because of the innocent blood, the volumes of innocent blood that Manasseh shed in the land, God would not withhold the coming of the fifth course of chastening. It, it, at, at that point, there was just nothing to hold it back. Okay, Now, who reigned after Manasseh? Look at chapter uh, 21, 
19, and this is a correction I had to make from two weeks ago, and I mentioned it last week. So after Manasseh dies, now who reigns? Verse 19, a guy named Ammon, and he doesn't do any good. Look at chapter 22 now. Now you've got who? Verse, verse 1 there, who is it? Josiah. And we spent probably two weeks already, although you could spend months and months studying about Josiah's wonderful reign. But what do you know, what do you remember about Josiah? What about Josiah? Who remembers? Ken, go ahead. Yes, he sure did. Yes, by name, exactly. God identified many, many years before that he was going to raise up someone, Josiah by name, who would do as well. Okay, so excellent point, Clinton. It's very, very important. What else do you remember about Josiah? What's that? That's right. He found the book of the, of the Lord in the house of the Lord. He found the Word of God. <laughs> A written copy of the perfect Word of God. And he let it affect his heart. He actually, his heart was open, open to God anyway, as it were. And then he just kept being more open and more eager to learn and study. Everything. Josiah, of all the reformers in the Southern Empire, Josiah set the standard. He was truly the greatest of all the reformers. As wonderful as Hezekiah was, and he was, well, Josiah really raised the bar to another level. He was very young when he began to reign. His heart was tender to the Lord, and he just let the Word of God continue to get into his heart. What was one of the major feasts that he held? And, and um, you know, he, he reinstituted all of them and everything. But what was the major feast that he held that gets recorded in great detail? Who remembers what it was? Passover. Passover. And we ask the question, why, of all the things that Josiah reinstituted, why are the great details here about the Passover, why are they recorded? And why are we told that, boy, there was just none like it. Uh, look, look over to chapter 23. Look over to chapter 23, verse 21. Watch this, 23, 21 of 2 Kings, 2 Kings 23, 21. And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. Surely there was not holden such a Passover from the days of the judges. Good. So now we're going back, where in that statement, where does that take you back to? The book of yeah, the book of Judges. You see, all the way back to when God brought Israel into the land under Joshua. In Joshua's day, they, how did they do? Joshua's day and that generation, how did they do? They did really well. But man, as soon as that generation... Was that the wrong word? Well, okay, good. <laughs> My wife gives me signals every once in a while. You know, so, oh, so, um, Joseph, go ahead. Yeah, but yeah, that's a great question. Joseph says, what about David and Solomon? David and Solomon were not so much reformers. The kingdom was kind of on a rise at that point. They kept building and building and building. Yes, Solomon was, was the greatest of all. And after Solomon, and really because of his departure, it all went south really fast. So they are reforming everything. Is, 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 was that the sense of your question? Yeah. Well, yeah. No, that verse doesn't say they didn't celebrate it. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, so the question was about in David's day and Solomon's day, didn't they keep the Passover? The answer is yes. Look at how it is at verse 22. Surely there was not holding such a Passover. So not a Passover at all. Just not such a Passover from the days of judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah. So it doesn't mean they didn't observe it. It means with their wholehearted heart devoted to it, is the sense here. Isn't that wonderful? And so that's a really good... I, I didn't understand your question at first, uh, uh, Joseph, there. So, um, All right, so now what happens is this. So towards the, uh, a little bit later, what happens is Josiah makes an awful decision in terms of going up against the king of Egypt, and he gets... Uh, unfortunately, he takes a mortal wound in the battle in Megiddo, you look at verse 29, at 23, 29. In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. And the king Josiah went against him and he slew him at Megiddo. That is, the king of Egypt slew Josiah. This was a terrible decision by Josiah. 
when he had seen him. And so they carry him back to Jerusalem. He dies. So now we're going to pick up, look at verse 30. And his servants carried him in a chariot dead from Megiddo and brought him to Jerusalem, buried him in his own sepulcher. The people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah. Keep in mind, um, maybe I should have written Josiah up here. Okay. Let's go like this. So this is his son. Uh, how can I do that? Okay, this guy here is his son. This is going to come up here in a moment, okay? Will that make sense I'm doing that? So keep that in mind, because it can get a little confusing as you read down through some of this. So look at verse... Um, it, it, uh, they took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king instead of his father. Jehoahaz was 20 and 3 years old when he began to reign. He reigned three months. So he doesn't reign very long in Jerusalem. His name... His mother's name was, keep an eye on this, uh, Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. That, that, that's going to come up again. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to his father has done. Pharaoh, uh, <coughs> Pharaoh Necho put him in bands at, at Riblah in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem and put the land to tribute. He basically taxed the land there. Of a hundred talents of silver, talents of gold. Pharaoh Nico made Eliakim. So now we're going to go to this guy, Eliakim. See that there? The son of Josiah, king in the room of Josiah, his father, and turned his name to Jehoiakim. See it here? So Eliakim is whose son? Do you see verse 20, 34? Is that pretty clear? So this guy is now this guy's son. Did I, did I get that right? Everybody see that? This can, like I say, this can be a little confusing as you go here. So now you've got Eliakim. Now watch what happens at verse 34. Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim the son of Josiah, king of Rumen, Josiah's father, and turned his name to what? Jehoiakim. And took Jehoiakim away and, and came to Egypt and he died there. Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh. See, he taxed the land to give the money to Pharaoh. Look at verse 36. Now Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned how many years? He reigns 11 years in Jerusalem. So he actually, this guy reigned 3 months. Okay, this guy reigns 11 years. Verse 36, Joachim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was uh, Zabuda, the daughter of Padiah of Rumah. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. Okay, now watch chapter 24. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant. How many years? Three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. That is Jehoiakim. After the three years, he, se he seeks to rebel against the king Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 2 now. And the Lord sent. Now before I read the rest of the verse, what's significant? What should we understand and take away from that phrase? And the Lord sent. Who's doing this? That clearly says the Lord's doing it. Well, wait a minute. Why? What's happening here? That, that's right. The fifth course of chastening. God is dealing with them under the law. And he told them time and time and time again that I'm going to use this means to, to chastise you. And if you won't respond, then it's going to be seven times worse. Seven times worse. Seven times worse. So when you see these phrases here, uh, verse 2, the Lord sent. Look at verse 3. I'm going to come back to the verses in a moment. Verse 3, surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he did and also for the innocent blood that he shed for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood which the Lord, what? Ever see the significance of these statements? There came absolute events and times 
in Israel's history, and therefore in the history of humanity at that time, that God withdrew any opportunity to pardon. Get that? Question. In the dispensation of grace, as long as the dispensation of grace is going on, is God withdrawing any opportunity for pardon? No. So who can be saved in the dispensation of grace? Everybody see that? This is not that. It's different. Not only that, the, the phrase is here, and the Lord sent. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah. When people talk about God intervening in the affairs of men, you're reading it right there. Ever see that? This was direct God intervention in the nations of the world and therefore directly affecting the people of those nations. God's not doing that today. That is not how God is operating among the nations in the dispensation of grace. For one, God was doing that because he's dealing with his nation under the law. But no nation, as far as God is concerned, is under the Mosaic law today. All men are guilty by the law. But God is not dealing with nations today in the dispensation of grace like he would dealt with nations back then. It's a major dispensational change in the way that God is dealing with humanity. Everybody grasp that? That's important. When we saw the last two and a half years now, all the worldwide events that happened over the lockdowns and stuff like that, I mean, just, it, just the idea, it just swept through the internet kind of thing. That, oh, this is, we're in the tribulation period. This is God, you know, manipulating the nations and God doing this and that. And, and the Antichrist is on the scene. And some even went so far as to say that the vaccine was the mark of the beast and so forth. Sound doctrine, the word of God, rightly divided, will set you free from that confusing doctrine, that confusing those lies and so forth. We still live in the dispensation of grace. And as long as the dispensation of grace is here, the church, the body of Christ, is actually the staying force holding back the continuation of the prophecy program. Now, does that mean, therefore, I'm saying that things aren't bad? No, things are really bad, <laughs> right? But it's been a present evil world. The Apostle Paul's the one that told us that. So when you read verses like this, when it says at 22, 24, verse 2, and the Lord sent. Verse 23, Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah. Don't allow yourself. Be very careful with how you allow yourself to think about those verses and people will say, well, see, God is, is uh, you know, from eternity past, He determined He would do this, that, and that kind of... No, no, no. You now have an absolute clear context to understand what those statements mean, what's happening here. And this is God beginning to bring in the multiple waves, as it were, of the fifth course of chastening on the southern kingdom. That's what this is. So, it was in the days of Jehoiakim, that guy, Eliakim, is Jehoiakim. It was in his days when Pharaoh began, not Pharaoh, not Pharaoh, who? Nebuchadnezzar, thank you. <laughs> he sends his armies to begin the besiege of the southern empire. So look at verse 1 again, 24-1. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years, then he turned and rebelled against him, and the Lord sent against him, watch this, the bands of the Chaldees, the bands of the Syrians, the bands of the Moabites. By the way, this is not a musical concert of bands, Right? <laughs> And the bands of the Moabites, the bands of the children of Ammon, all their mortal enemies, as it were, and sent them against Judah to destroy it. Look at the next statement. According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets. We read one of them. Isaiah said to Hezekiah, all the stuff that you just showed the king of Babylon and his ambassadors, 
Here, they come to get it. You see what's going on here? Jeremiah would be another one that had conveyed this information. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh. Okay, and read that for the innocent blood that was shed. Verse 4, and also for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. I need to stop there. Sometimes I read this way too fast. And it's easy to not really let it sink in. If, if you fill Jerusalem with innocent blood, what are you doing? It's just wholesale, all-out slaughter of the believing remnant on public display. You, What was Jerusalem supposed to be? Jerusalem was supposed to be the city of the great king. Beautiful for situation. It was supposed to be the joy of the whole earth. But now it had become, and back to the days of Manasseh, which is what, what, what that's talking about there. It had become the place, the worldwide display of the absolute slaughter of the believing remnant in Israel. He fills Jerusalem with innocent blood. Just fills it. You, you can't fill a city the size of Jerusalem with innocent blood by killing five people. you got to kill thousands. Man, that, that, had, that had to have been, even for the remnant. They, they knew to trust in God. They knew to believe in God. That had to have been a terrifying time to live. Moms, dads, for your children. It's awful. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did are not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah. So Jehoiakim slept with his fathers and Jehoiachin, his son, reigned in his stead. So now we're going to go Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin. Um, does M come before N in the alphabet? Okay, just checking. Okay. By the way, that's how you can remember which guy reigns first, which one's reigns second. M N. Anyway, at least that's what I do. Okay. <laughs> right. So you look down in verse um, seven, and the king of Egypt came not again in, anymore out of the land, for the king of Babylon had taken from the river of Egypt unto the river Euphrates all that pertained to the king of Egypt. So now the king of Babylon is conquering everybody. You can see from a verse like that. If we have time, we'll get to a passage in Jeremiah. You'll see more details about this. So look at verse 8 now. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem also very short term. See that, just three months. His mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. At that time, now watch this, at that time the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem and the city was besieged. So Nebuchadnezzar's army initially comes up during the reign of Jehoiakim. And he's occupied the territory since. And remember, he reigned for 11 years, three of which he's willingly subdued to Nebuchadnezzar, and then he rebelled. And now Jehoiachin reign, reigns. Okay, watch this now. Look at the details. Verse 11, Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, went out, the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers and the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. So there's one of the deportations. He carried out thence. Watch what else happens. He carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king's house, cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord as the Lord had said. Think back many, many years before this. When King Solomon was at the height of his reign, we're told that all the kings of the nations of the world, they all sent ambassadors to Solomon. And when they sent those ambassadors, they did not send those ambassadors empty-handed. They lavished gold and silver and treasures upon King Solomon. And you know that over the years, as those various succeeding kings in those various empires. They wanted it back. And here they're getting it back. You see what's happening here? They're saying, that's ours. They take all the treasures, all the way that were in the house that uh, Solomon built, and the temple, 
Verse 14, he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained save the poorest sort of the people of the land. He carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon and the king's mother, the king's wives and his officers and the mighty of the land, those carried into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon, and all the men of might, even 7,000, and craftsmen, smiths of 1,000, all that were strong and apt for war, even them the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. See, there's one of the major deportations. Now, hold this verse here, if you would, and please go to Daniel chapter number 1. I mentioned something last time about Daniel being carried away, and let's kind of pinpoint a little bit more about Daniel. Uh, time-wise. I think this will help put some things together. Go to Daniel chapter number 1. Look at this. Daniel chapter number 1. Verse 1. Daniel 1.1. 1, 1. Because Daniel was one of the guys who was carried off into captivity. Yes? Do you remember that? Everybody remembers that? Look at Daniel chapter number 1. Verse 1. It says this. In the third year of the reign of who? Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. So you, now you're back here to this guy. Jehoiakim. And you're in the third year of his reign. Remember, he had been subject to King Nebuchadnezzar for three of his years. Then he rebels. And then a deportation occurs. He besieges the city. So look at what it says here. So I'm um, at uh, Daniel 1.1. 1, 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into Jerusalem and besieged it. So that will connect with what we just read about Jehoiakim. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands. Why and what? what what's that, Katie? Why? What, what, why, does, why does the Lord give Jehoiakim in Jerusalem into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar? How come? Fifth course of chastisement. Yeah, it, was it was prophesied. And it was prophesied because of the five courses of chastening. That's why you see a statement right there. This is not random. All these things that God is, you see these statements about the Lord gave them to him. None of this is random. This isn't God waking up in the morning and said, man, I didn't get my eight hours sleep last night and so my sleep score was really low, so I'm mad at somebody and I'm going to go attack Jerusalem. <laughs> That's not what's going on here. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand with part of the vessels of the house. I see part of the vessels. In Jehoiachin's day, they get a whole lot more, and then in, in Zedekiah's, they get the rest. At any rate, it says, part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge, uh, cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such. By the way, that's true science, okay? <laughs> At any rate, it says, and, uh, and such as had ability to them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might to whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldees. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these war of the children of Judah, and guess who's there? Who is it? You've got four of them. You've got Daniel, Hananiah, Mishal, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. They changed, uh, Henry, go ahead, sir. Yes, science falsely so-called. Does everybody hear what Henry just said? Very important observation. Let me repeat it for the folks on the internet. Henry made the observation that the word science in your English, your King James Bible there, it appears here, and this is the true science. Paul mentions it, science falsely so-called. That's a fascinating connection. Great, great observation. Thank you, Henry. Okay. Now you can see, therefore, that Daniel, as well as another group, was carried off in the, in the days of Jehoiakim. 
So he's, he's kind of in the very first group that goes into captivity. And what was the purpose, by the way, what was the purpose of changing the names, the Hebrew names of these four people? What was the purpose? To, to, to what? To, cha- to do what? To change their history, change their character. Tra- you see that? They're giving them the names of their gods to change the history books. Hmm. Think about modern education, what's been happening. That's the whole concept right there. It's nothing new under the sun. Okay, so, all right, so now you can, you can let go of Daniel there, and then go back with me, if you would, over to 2 Kings, uh, and back in 2 Kings chapter number 24. So, we're now at Jehoiachin, of course. They've been all carried away, so you've got a major deportation there. You had huge numbers. You've got 10,000 mentioned, verse 14. You've got 7,000 of the military men of might in verse 15. And you can see again, look at the repeated phrase. Look at verse 15. I'm at 2415. 2415, what's the repeated phrase? And he did what? Carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon, the king's mother, the king's wives, and officers, and the mighty of the land. Those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And all the men of might, even 7,000, and craftsmen, smiths, 1,000, all that were strong and at for war, even them, the king of Babylon, brought to, what's the next word there? Captivity. The beginning of the Babylonian captivity. Whenever you see that word captive, it's a very significant phrase uh, in the prophetic kingdom program. Someone please go back with me, if you go with me, everyone, in fact everyone, not someone, everyone, go, <laughs> go with me to the book of Job. How often do we use the phrase something like satanic captivity? Do we, do we use that phrase here kind of often, sometimes? Okay. Well, not sometimes and often. It's often, okay? <laughs> but we use that phrase pretty often. And you can see why we're, why we're using that phrase, what it's related to. They really and truly went into captivity. When, they, when Abraham's seed initially goes down to Egypt, initially, they have, you know, 30 years, maybe things were okay, but boy, it went south after that pretty bad. So they were held in captivity, satanic captivity in Egypt. They come out, they're rescued out of satanic captivity, and now they're back, the southern kingdom's now back into the Babylonian captivity, all right? Job, when we studied some details about the book of Job, look at Job chapter 42, look at Job chapter 42, verse 10. Job 42, verse 10. Job 42, verse 10. And the Lord, what does it say there? Turned the captivity of Job. What does that mean? That he turned the captivity. What did he do? He delivered them. But in saying he turned the captivity of Job, therefore what was true about what what Job was experiencing? Satanic captivity. Everybody see that there? What was true of Job, and you've heard that Job of all the books in the Bible, the book of Job predates even the writing of the book of Genesis. Do you understand how I said that? It doesn't predate details in Genesis 1. It predates the writing of Genesis and Exodus, etc. So you see that phrase, the Lord turned Job's captivity. The Lord's going to turn Israel's Egyptian captivity. He's going to turn their Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. And the ultimate turning of their captivity is going to happen when? The end of that tribulation period. And we're in that, when they are in that tribulation period, that's when they're going to be under that seven times worse satanic captivity. And he's going to turn it for them. And if you want to do an interesting study about the phrase, he's going to lead captivity captive. Wow. That's not only rescuing Israel, that's that's imprisoning the captors. Anyway, so let's go back with me over to 2 Kings 24. So now look who's next. 2 Kings 24. How are we doing on time? 2 Kings 24, uh, verse 17 now. Uh, and the king of Babylon made Mathaniah. Okay, so that's that one right there. It says this. 
the king of Babylon made Mathaniah his father's brother king in his stead and changed his name to Zedekiah. So now we're at this guy's name who's Zedekiah. The, the thing that can be a little confusing when it says he's his father's brother. Turn with me please to Jeremiah 37, but hold, hold kings, go to Jeremiah 37. I realize I'm kind of all over the map this morning, but hopefully this is making a little bit of sense in terms of trying to tie some things together and being able to, to identify who these people are. Look at Jeremiah um, 37. This is going to help us see a couple of things. 37.1. Watch this. And King Zedekiah... Okay, so you now, so you now know where we're at, right? 37.1. So King Zedekiah, the son of who? Okay, so this guy is whose son? We're going to go back, back there, right? Did that make sense? But watch what else. King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of who? Okay, so what, who reigned just before Zedekiah? What was his name back there in Kings? Jehoiachin. But there you know he's also known as who? Coniah. Huh. What's the difference between the name Jeconiah and the name Coniah? Something's missing. Jehovah. Jehovah's missing. And we'll see in just a moment the significance of that. Okay, But look at that verse again. King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah, and so forth. You see that there? Uh, let's see. Look over with me to... <clears throat> Go to 27. Go to chapter 27 of Jeremiah. T I tell you what, before we do that, let's go back to 2 Kings. But, but do hold on to Jeremiah. Just put a marker there. Go ahead, Lori. So you're saying that Nazanite is a direct son of Josiah. Because sometimes when they say son, they mean grandson. Yeah, that's a great question. In this case, because we're told what it, what it said over in Kings there, it says, uh, look, look back at uh, 2 Kings 24. Zedekiah was, go back to verse 17. And the king of Babylon made Mathani his father's brother king. See that? So these guys, so he's his uncle, as it were, okay? But he's the son of this guy. This guy had three, he actually had three, at least three sons. I think he had, I think he had three sons, okay? One of which is this guy here. But watch what else. You look at 18, 24, 18. Zedekiah was 20 and 1 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was who? Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah. That's the same one back over in chapter 23, verse 31. Okay? That's why I say it, 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 it definitely can be confusing. You've got to kind of put these together and say, wait a minute, is this guy this guy's son or this guy's brother or uncle? Well, yes, yes, yes. Okay? So it can be a little... <laughs> it, that's correct. Yeah. So wrap your head around that one this week. If you figure it out, bring it back to all of us. Help us out. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so now, are you back in 2 Kings 24? Yes. Watch this now. Verse 18 now. Zedekiah was 20 and 1 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. So next to that one, that's 2 Kings 23, 31 to compare. Now watch verse 19. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For through the anger of the Lord it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah until he had cast them out from his presence that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. And it came to pass 
in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day, the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his host, against Jerusalem and pitched against it. They built forts against it round about. Remember, he, he, Nebuchadnezzar has had his troops occupying the land since the days of Jehoiakim. And have multiple invasions. And in the days of Zedekiah, this is, this is truly the final one. They take everything now. Watch this. Look at verse 2. The city was besieged. I'm not going to be able to get through all this, but uh, it says the city was besieged until the eleventh year of Zedekiah, and on the ninth day of the month, the fourth month, the famine prevailed in the city. People are just starving to death. There was no bread for the people of the land. The city was broken up, and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the... I mean, they're just abandoning the city, their families, the gate between two walls, which is by the king's garden. Now the Chaldees were against the city round about, and the king went away toward the plain, and the arm of the Chaldees pursued after the king. Now watch the next phrase here. And guess where they overtake him? In the plains of what? What do you remember about Jericho? That's where they initially came in, in the military conquest of the land in the days of Joshua. Jericho back then was one of the major strongholds that Satan had established to maintain his control over the land. Remember, he did that in multiple major cities, forming like, like, uh, like blockades, as it were, to prevent Israel from coming and occupying the land. And Jericho was one of the strongest fortresses that Satan created at the time. And God on purpose has Joshua lead Israel into the military con conquest of the land straight through the stronghold of Jericho. And he conquers it. And he puts on display through Joshua and the nation of Israel at that time. God puts on display saying to Satan and the Gentiles, I'm here to take my land back. And now when, when the king flees, you know where they capture him? Jericho, the plains of Jericho. That ancient city that had been one of the strongholds. What a message of Satan saying, as it were, to God. In your face, God. I got it back now. It's mine. In a sense, there's way more than just human battles going on here. These are, all, these are major satanic spiritual fights between Satan's attempt to maintain control over the earth and God's right to reclaim it for himself. Go ahead, Garrett. It's funny how Satan, following on what you were saying, how Satan takes credit for it, even though God is the one that initiated it in chapter 24. It's exactly right. What Garrett said, let me repeat it for the folks on the internet. Garrett said, Satan is the one wanting to take, see, I did this, I did this, I, you know, and yet God is the one who's giving his own people into captivity, and therefore God is coming out of the land. God's backing out of the land by bringing his people. So that's a great observation there. Let me keep reading, and then we're going to have to stop for, because of time. They take him in the, in the plains of Jericho. Look at verse 6. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Bab uh, uh, Babylon, to Riblah, and they gave judgment upon him, and they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. It made him watch as he slaughters his own sons right before his eyes. And you know what they did? They put out the eyes of Zedekiah. The last thing that man saw, witnessed, was the his own sons being slaughtered. That memory was etched in his mind as the last thing this man saw for the rest of his life. Again, that's a satanic event happening right here. Yes. Satan is saying, fine, Zedekiah, he was the next in line. We, we didn't get to it today. We'll look at it next time. God had already cursed Jehoiakim's seed line 
for burning the book. And he says, though Coniah is the signet on my right hand, the, the, the ring, God says, though Coniah is the signet on my right hand, I'm going to take that ring off, and there's no man of that guy's seed, that guy's seed, that's ever going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem again. God curses that line right there. By the way, one reason for the necessity of the virgin birth, in addition to escaping Adam's sin. And so now you've got, that's why Zedekiah, this guy goes back here. And so when they put out, when they slay, when Satan, when Babylon says, slays Zedekiah's sons, you know what he's saying? You've got no heir. No seed line. No seed line. Stop this one's been cursed. Now we slew this seed line. And what would you say, Tom? No seed line. And not only that, when he blinds him. So he destroys the seed line and blinds the very king like blindness. A political blindness upon the very southern empire. Ever see what's happening here? Look at, look at what it goes on to say. Uh, in the fifth month and the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, King Neb uh, King Neb Nebuchadnezzar, Captain of the guard, servant of the king of Babylon, Jerusalem, and he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great man's house burnt to He just burns it to the ground, just utterly destroys it. I'm, I'm way over time, I apologize. Let's, let's, we'll pick up here next time. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the details that are here. They're hard sometimes to read and think about, but boy, Lord, the insight and the wisdom that we gain by studying this and seeing this. And it really helps us to appreciate that we live in the dispensation of grace. And as long as this dispensation of grace is still operational, which it is, heaven is still saying to the earth, be ye reconciled before it's time to withdraw the offer. And then there would be no remedy. Thank you for your love and your kindness to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.